Hi all, this is Angela. Uh, welcome to my talk at the non-con. Um, it's kind of, this is the recording of my talk that I uh, want to share with you. And it's about the current and future, uh, current state and future web free sustainability models. Okay, I'll share my screen. All right, let's go. So let me briefly introduce myself. I'm Angela. I've co-founded the token engineering community. Um, I co-organized NonCon. I had a tiny role helping to curate the talks in the Crypto Economics Lab channel. And I'm running many of the activities in our community. My background is venture development. So I was in early stage startups for um, around eight years now developing business models, data-driven MVPs, investment decision-making for a seed stage or pre-seed. And I entered the blockchain sector because I was, let's say I was fascinated by the new opportunities of economies that we can design from scratch, basically. And of course, designing incentives and a new economy is a huge opportunity but at the same time a huge responsibility and in addition to that i believe in the vision of web, of web 3 so that what that's what brought me to token engineering and um yeah i'm i'm still fascinated what we are achieving with building this new engineering discipline token engineering now a couple of weeks ago, we started uh, the, the initiative Tokens 2020 Ecosystem Survey. So this is, I'm doing together with Marina Markeshitz. And there we are discussing the current stage of tokens with blockchain projects, um, token funding, the development of crypto economic patterns and primitives, and the involvement of roles and best practices for token engineering. Uh, I'd like to start with the vision of Web3. Um, let's take a look at it again. It's data sovereignty. Users own their data. It's about a collectively owned and managed universal state layer. And it's about trustless peer-to-peer -peer transactions without intermediaries. Now, today, after we have a range of protocols successfully launched, the question is how to grow the ecosystems around those platforms. And Trent McConaughey from Ocean Protocol um, wrote an article on it. And he's asking, how do we make the ecosystem not only self-sustaining, but growing? And there you could consider web-free businesses. But he says, this doesn't make sense because web-free platforms aren't businesses. On the other hand, there is a voice from the VC side. Joel John from Outlier Ventures states, if massive outcomes in terms of customers, this is about adoption, is what a founder's focus is it, then the token grant ecosystem alone might not fuel the next big thing in this ecosystem. So the conclusion here is, on one hand, we have the protocol layer. Layer one, the base layer protocols providing consensus. Layer two, the scaling layers. And in addition to that, service protocols, for optimized for use cases and specific application cases. So this could be an ocean protocol for the data economy. This could be a polymer for security tokens. This could be foam for location. Um, so there is the protocol layer. And you consider, can consider it as, as Trent mentioned, a public infrastructure. But what about the application layer? Now there's an interesting development DYDX um, exchange just announced to split in A, the decentralized protocols, which they develop, which will no longer incur trading fees. And on the other hand, the trading business on top of it that will indeed charge fees. So the model looks like that. We have at the, at the fundament, the protocol layer, as a public decentralized infrastructure, and on top of it, a product or a centralized business that is the application layer. Now, let's take a closer look at two different approaches on funding Web3. 
VC investments versus ecosystem funding. Um, what do we have? With ecosystem funding, um, we, have, we are deploying funding for community proposed projects for accomplishments in a, on a specific bounty or as a price based on curation or community votes to developers and or marketing activities. So this is roughly the current stage. Now, looking at it, the, the benefits of ecosystem funding is there the foundations understand Web3 or the communities around it. Um, they try to push decentralized government and leverage the community. On the other hand, what might be problematic is that they are focused too much on technology and not enough on product market fit and business models. The other side, VCs, they invest in funding, funding rounds, uh, several stages. So we have the seed stage, series A, B. Um, they normally, or in a lot of cases, prefer equity investments and not, are not going for token investments anymore. They are used to build centralized organizations and they require a business model or product market fit. Now, the benefit of it is the focus on product market fit, of course, helps to drive adoption. On the other hand, they don't apply decentralized decision making for the, their funding decisions and they do not support decentralized organizations or at least they don't have that much experience in it and they don't embrace the Web3 vision. So in many cases, they go with the Web2 approach, capturing value in the company. So the equity investment basically encouraged to capture value in the company and not in the network. They take data as the unfair advantage. So that means you lock in data in your business instead to provide open access. Uh, they try to secure IP instead of open source and, and similar problems. So overall, the, let's say the majority of VCs are trying to copy paste Web2 on top of, decentralized, of a decentralized settlement layer. So my concern is that we are just building a more efficient, a more dynamic, a more data-driven web-free infrastructure accessible for everyone and as a result make centralized web 2 business model even more successful at the application layer. Now finally this brings us to the question what are the web-free business models for end-use applications? And how can we maintain the values of Web3 on the application layer? Now, in a trustless Web3 environment, business modeling is like economic modeling. And to learn more about economic modeling for applications, let's take a look at economic engineering. And I'd like to explain economic engineering by taking a look at DeFi. One billion US dollar are now locked in DeFi. This was as of February, 2020. And looking at DeFi and user applications and the total active users in the Ethereum ecosystem, we see that exchanges and finance applications are adding up to around 48% of the total active user base. And now, Let's consider DeFi end user applications as a large scale MVP experiment because there we have a lot of variants. We already have data and actual users. And this is basically an ideal scenario to start engineering economies. So you might have heard of staking tokens, locking tokens, mint tokens, burn tokens, wrap ETH, smart tokens, C tokens, passive holders, active holders, collaterals, liquidity pools, pool debt, bonding curves, bonding surface, market makers, price oracles, constant product, staking rewards, interest rates, stability fees. 
and probably more. And all those cryptoeconomic primitives are used for borrowing and lending money. This is the core value proposition to end users in DeFi applications. So this value proposition is basically quite simple, as it should be. But there's a lot of complexity under the hood. And this is new in crypto and in web free business models. It's economic complexity, not only software, or data complexity to enable still very simple value propositions. Now, business modeling for web free, as mentioned, is economic engineering. Now, how is this special? I'd like to take you on a journey to automotive engineering. This is a turbocharger. The turbocharging technique is playing a fundamental role in improving automotive engineering performance. And this is why they are so popular for sports cars. And uh, today there is a new use, use case, efficiency, because a turbo turbocharger can also reduce fuel consumption and the exhaust emissions. So they play a role for very environmentally friendly small cars. And if you want to apply such a new component for a new use case, uh, you don't just buy a charger off the shelf and mount it to another engine or just go with it. Nope, a new use case means you prepare for industrial production and tens of thousands of car buyers and drivers. So you don't take any real world component at this point, you rather model the system and build a digital twin. And that's what automotive engineers do. Now you build a digital twin like this one. First, briefly, here's how a turbocharger works. The car engines produce power by burning fuel in sturdy metal cans called cylinders, like you see it in the, at the bottom. The air enters each cylinder, mixes with fuel, and then burns to make a small explosion that drives a piston out. Now turning the shafts and gears that spin the car's wheel, when the piston pushes back in, it pumps the waste air and fuel mixture out of the cylinder exhaust. This is what you can see here. Now the amount of power a car can produce is directly related to how fast it burns fuel. So the more cylinders you have, for example, and the bigger they are, the more fuel the car can burn each second. And theoretically, at least, the faster it can go. Now, with a turbocharger, it uses the gas to drive a turbine, like you see it at the very top. And this spins on the left an air compressor that pushes extra air and oxygen into the cylinders. And that's why a turbocharged car can produce more power. Now, as mentioned, as an engineer, you are building a digital twin. And first you need to define the new use case, the context, and what you want to achieve. In this case, it's to reduce the fuel consumption and to make burning fuel more efficient. Now, what's also important is that you can take a look at the engine turbocharger matching. Because the compressor capacity on top needs to match the volume of the engine exhaust at the lower level. So, that, and that's important to select the boost level in different operating conditions. So you look at the system interaction and the interconnectivity between the two systems, the engine at the bottom and the turbocharger on top. And finally, you take a look at the components in use. So the compressor and the turbine. For finding out the best con configuration, for example, you model variants uh, to balance the efficiency of the turbine and the compressor. So these are the 
uh, using the characteristics of the components. And normally you don't do this from scratch as well. Instead, you have characteristic maps available for both the turbine and compressor. And here you see a modeling in order to balance the efficiency of both components. Um, and you can also run, the, or normally engineers run very typical simulations in this case because the sensitivities of such configurations and components are well explored. So overall, you don't just take a turbocharger mounted to a different car and see what happens. Instead, you rather build a digital twin and simulate the new operating conditions, the context, the system interaction of engine and turbocharger, and the characteristics of the individual components in use. Okay, now let's get back to our large-scale MVP experiment, uh, DeFi. So first, let's take a look at a very important component in DeFi that are automated market makers. They define the price of a crypto asset. Now, why do we need them? They enable an automated price definition for buying and selling a particular token. Uh, and because the trading volume must cross a critical barrier in any market, they match between buyers and sellers are frequent enough. So uh, the, the matches between buyers and sellers need to be frequent enough to be reliable. And in traditional financial markets, uh, the market makers solve this liquidity problems by always offering both buy and selling a financial, a financial asset. Um, so typically the market makers are large financial institutions that leverage their significant reserves to generate profit. Now in decentralized exchanges, we don't want to have this middleman role and this centralized power thus implementing automated market makers. Now, one of the most popular automated market makers is LS, uh, LMSR. So this is uh, the logarithmic market scoring rule. Uh, this rule has been implemented in numeral online settings long before blockchain applications. Um, for example, online ad auctions or prediction markets. And this market scoring rule is implemented in Augur, for example. And it's basically assessing the probability of a certain outcome in a cost function, like you can see it here. And it's using a liquidity parameter as a, as a specific element that needs to be adapted to the specific liquidity of the market. Otherwise, the price defined by the market maker will react too sticky or too rapidly. And since defining the liquidity parameter in such early stage markets like blockchain uh, is hard. This is, let's say, um, a component that is difficult to implement or to, to use properly. Okay, on the other hand, we have another variant of auto automated market makers, which is Uniswap's constant products. Uh, so typically an exchange has an order book comprised of limit orders with buy and sell orders of various quantities and prices and the traders who come to an exchange look through these orders and find quantities and prices that match their needs. Now in contrast to these traditional markets, the Uniswap model holds an order book where all liquidity provision trades are pooled together and trades are priced according to this constant product mechanisms. And in this system, the liquidity available on both sides of a potential trade, token X and token Y, is multiplied together and the product is held constant. And this is used to determine the price of all transactions. Now to put it simple, if the number of token X is reduced, the number of token Y must be increased in a pool and this will define the price. So here, overall, we have the characteristics of two variants of an automated market maker. And you can see by the assets held in February 2020 that the Uniswap constant function market makers uh, is much more popular, much more popular. Okay. 
Now, ideally, we could have the same char characteristic maps, like mentioned before in mechanical engineering, for DeFi components to use it and model the behavior of our system and to make a decision which component works best in our case. Now, next, I'd like to talk about oracles in DeFi and system interactions. First, why do we need oracles? A smart contract is unable to connect with key external resources like off-chain data or APIs. So thus, a smart contract cannot change its behavior in response to some external event. Why? Because the blockchain is a consensus-based system and it only works if every node reaches an identical state and after processing every transaction and block. And that everything takes place on a blockchain must be completely deterministic and so there's no possible way for differences to occur. And the moment that two honest nodes disagree about the chain state, the entire system becomes worthless. So instead of a smart contract initiating the retrieval of external data, one or more trusted parties, the oracles, create a transaction which embeds data in the chain. And then every node will have an identical copy of this data. So it can be safely used in a smart contract computation. And interestingly enough, back in 2017, there were no price oracles to consume for DeFi, the very early stage of DeFi. So the early projects just ran their own 15 different computers sending a transaction with a price and then the system aggregated the data. But there you see oracles are a critical piece in DeFi and they are an own system with own components and own rules. Now let's take a look at the flash loan attack um, that happened just a couple of weeks ago. Here's an overview how the attack unfolded. So actually there were two attacks, first with uh, around 350K and then later with even 600K US dollars lost. So first, the attacker borrowed 10K ETH at DYDX on the left, step one, and sent 50% uh, to compound to buy 112 wrapped Bitcoin. The other 50% went to BZX to open a five times borrow in order to short ETH and it leveraged the Kyber swap to swap ETH for rep Bitcoin in return. Um, the trade was routed via Kyber swap to Uniswap. And as a result, the dr it drives up the price for rep Bitcoin to two, three times of the initial price. So this was the, the first attack, uh, the pump, um, who would, well, um, has driven the price of uh, rep Bitcoin. Okay, um, next with the spiked rep Bitcoin price in Uniswap, the attacker sells the compound borrowed 112 rep Bitcoin back for ETH in Uniswap. And this was the number two, the dump, and ultimately paid back the ETH loan at DYDX as the last step. And by um, conducting this attack, the attacker actually made a net profit of 350k US dollar. And what's important to know here is that this wasn't a hack. The trader simply found an exploit and gamed the systems involved. And it was all done via one single transaction. The attacker didn't need to own any own ETH for this attack. Because basically you can borrow without any credit or collateral in a flash loan. Uh, so flash loans are basically a well-known instrument to provide loans to traders to liquidate loans at the lender's behalf. And they, there you don't need to own any collateral uh, and this works as long as you do it in a single transaction. So basically this attack was 
exploiting a weakness in the system interaction of Uniswap, KyberSwap, and BZX. And because, so basically because of the big volume of the trade um, and the way how Uniswap works, remember the constant product function, this caused a big price swing. And in addition to that, in the aftermath of the uh, attack, the Oracle question was raised again, even though this turned out not to be the root cause of this attack. But nevertheless, BZX then announced to adapt Chainlinks networks. Uh, this is a network of oracles uh, that provides an aggregated price signal based on a consensus mechanism. So um, this kind of should improve uh, the stability and the reliability of the price signal of the Oracle BZX is using for the marching trading protocol. Okay, now let's take a look at the final step, the context for DeFi application. What happens in case of a significant price shock? You know that at the moment we are living in very difficult market conditions and I guess uh, you bet now Shields should suggest, okay, um, we should model the context and then we'll be fine. Actually, I, I won't, uh, not, at least not at this point, because there is actually an existing simulation on DeFi market conditions. So there's a paper from Louis Gudgeon, Daniel Paris, Dominic Hartz, Arthur Gervais, and Benjamin Lifshitz from Imperial College of London. And it was published on February 19, 2020. Now, for this paper, they modeled a severe price crash. So they state, we simulate a price crash event with our stress test methodology to a generic DeFi landing protocol that's, that closely resembles the largest DeFi protocols to date by volume, maker, synthetics, and compound. And they modeled the price drop of ETH in early 2018. So this is historical data and simulated how ETH and the reserve price changes um, and how they may be expected to evolve over the next 100 days and ran 5,000 simulations and found out that it takes just over 50 days of the protocol attempting to liquidate as much debt as possible. And then this would simply constitute a crisis in this protocol because the collateral backend is, backing is not sufficient anymore. So what does that mean? Each unit of debt would not have sufficient collateral backing and rational agents with weak identities would walk away from the protocol just without repaying their debt. And then after this study on March 12th, the crypto market crash kicked in. And now you might say, hey Maker, we could have known this, we could have simulated this, but actually in this case, it's not true because the paper was analyzing the problems occurring due to insufficient collateral backing. But actually what was the problem for MakerDAO on the Crypto Black Thursday was network congestion and gas price. Okay, first you need to know any user who wishes to generate DAI must deposit a collateral e.g. ETH and open up a vault. So they must maintain a collateralized ratio, CR, and this is the ratio of the value of the DAI, which is stable, and the value of the ETH in the vault, which is not stable. And if the vault's liquidation ratio is reached, the position gets liquidated. And ETH, or ETH, if the value of ETH drops, you can either add more ETH to the vault or um, liquidation means your ETH gets sold. And this is exactly what happened. So 
On March 12th, ETH saw a dramatic drop in price. Um, it was losing 30% of the value in approximately 24 hours. And this plus a rapid increase in gas prices put stress on the maker protocol. Um, so crypto started tanking and um, this caused network congestion, in increasing the gas cost and, the, and also a transaction backlog because Ethereum network could not quickly process additional collateral deposits by vault holders anymore. And the automated bots of keepers who play a critical role in the system didn't work anymore, or they weren't cal cal calibrated to the sudden increase of the gas price. So um, for some background keepers uh, are, have the role to monitor the collateralization ratio. And in case a position um, is li uh, liquidated, they can bid on the auctions selling ETH. Okay. Now in this case, uh, keepers didn't issue transactions with sufficiently high gas prices. And as a result, this entire liquidation process failed. Uh, and then only one or maybe a few aggressive keepers were bidding zero with sufficiently high gas prices. And uh, then wards get liquidated for bidding zero die over an hour uh, or over two to three hours. And as a result, many vault owners just lost their funds. So in this case, it wasn't under collateralization as modeled. It was network congestion and gas price increase the liquidation mechanism failed. And also the, the assumption that keepers basically work in favor of the protocols and don't want to hurt the protocol was wrong. Now, what can we learn? We could use living models like the digital twins to model variants, feeding in existing data to capture learnings like this one and to detect various sensitivities um, and attack vectors to and understand the social factor, for example, malicious keepers. And for DeFi, I would love to use those learnings and capture these learnings in models that are not, so that we don't have large scale MVP experiments in reality where people actually are losing money, but rather large scale simulation experiments. Um, as this was mentioned, I think yesterday by Vinay Gupta as well, and I share this, this perspective, these incidents like um, the, the flash loan attack or like the, the price drop resulting in so many people uh, losing funds, these incidents are so damaging for the entire ecosystem, for the stakeholders, for the users, for us all, for the web free vision and people's trust in this vision, and also for funding, of course. Now, I'd like to propose to have such digital twins as a common good. These models should be open source and reusable for various projects like one model could be used in so many DeFi applications <clears throat> to share the results, to increase the robustness and maturity. For example, horizontally, what's the best solution, the most robust component or primitive, or vertically for the composability, the layer of economies and the system interaction in DeFi. So these digital twins, could be developed in a decentralized fashion and could be shared as a common good. And that's exactly what Common Stack is trying to achieve. And that's why I'm so happy to support them. What, what also we think is really relevant to have a library of cryptoeconomic building blocks. So this is a registry of patterns and primitives to build digital twins to enable simulations and to engineer new web-free business models. And we want to launch this initiative um, based on the Gitcoin grant. And hopefully we can put together a working group 
um, working on this registry. And if you're interested, so please drop us a message on Twitter via Talk Engineering or our other channels. Um, I think we will have our kickoff meeting um, after April 6th, so just reach out. And last but not least, of course, I'd like to make you aware of our Gitcoin grant for the token engineering community. You can support us. Um, currently, one DAI contribu contribution should match with 54 DAI, so every single DAI helps. And with this, uh, thanks for watching. I'm looking forward to see you in one of our channels. And thanks also for the non-con organizers to running this conference and sharing my video. Thank you.